name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are almost upon Nativity, or the Incarnation, celebrating the Incarnation of our Lord. Of course, that's Tuesday. So this is the Sunday before Nativity, and we read this passage from the Scripture that a lot of people call the begats, right? Because all the begats are in there, about all of the generations that preceded Christ, and also, of course, about the birth of Christ. And... The, I don't want to speak about the begats today. I want to speak about the application of the begats, the application of the incarnation, which I think is most evident in the epistle today. Now, the epistle, some people call it, I remember when I was a Protestant, we call it the hall of faith, right? By faith, by faith, by faith. St. Paul repeats multiple times, I think six times altogether. By faith, all these things happen. But the, all these people that were doing these things by faith, Abraham and Gideon and Joseph and all of the rest, they were doing these things by faith, but they were not obtaining the promise because the promise was reserved when the incarnation came and the, then the fruits of that promise, which would be Jesus Christ living as a perfect man and telling us how to live as a perfect man. And then not only telling us how, but giving us the ability to do so through baptism. That's the promise that they did not obtain, even though they suffered greatly and they did things by faith. So what does this by faith mean? It means there was active patience, belief, and obedience. It's an active thing. In our day, faith in many times is a passive idea. There's nothing whatsoever passive about Christianity. It is active. It is extremely intense and even violent. Scripture talks about that the kingdom of heaven is being won by violence and the violent take it by force. And this violence is violence against sin, violence against depravity, against the things that break down, against the things that are dead. We must have this violence. We must have this faith that moves us towards the promise. Now, the promised Messiah has come and he has taught his disciples and died on the cross, resurrected himself after three days, ascended into heaven, sent the Holy Spirit to us through baptism so that we can know him. All these things have transpired. Things that the Old Testament fathers and mothers, they didn't see. Now, I'm always looking for a practical application. I'm very practical about some things. My wife would differ about other things. Like, for instance, I'm only just learning that, you know, when you have oatmeal or you have bean soup, when you put it in the sink, you should fill it with water first, right? Because otherwise it dries and gets all crusty and it's harder to clean. And that's just a practical thing that I'm only beginning to learn. But in terms of Christianity, I've always been trying to learn the practical things for myself and to transmit them to you. So what is the practical lesson here? If we don't understand how to act, what does it matter if we know something? It doesn't, doesn't matter at all. It's just, just empty knowledge. It doesn't matter if you got the whole... Bible memorized. If you don't live according to the Bible, it doesn't matter. You might as well memorize the phone book. So what is the practical application? Well, what is it for nativity? Our purpose is to be healed, to be able to have knowledge of God. And you can't have knowledge of God without being perfected in the soul where all of the sin in the soul, the darkness of the soul, goes away and is replaced by light. Oh, God is light. The Holy Spirit is light. To be replaced by the Holy Spirit abiding in our hearts. And that is possible because of the incarnation. Now, the Hall of Faith shows that if a person really believes something, they can do anything. The things that they did, I don't want to go through them in, in absolute detail, but they're really breathtaking, the things that happen. We talked about being sawn asunder and scourged and imprisoned and in bonds and slain with the sword and wandering about. That might be one of the harder things. When a person 
is ostracized, when a person is alone, when a person has to endure for many, many years difficulties. That is a hard thing for a person. It's a very hard thing. It's pretty easy to have faith for a week or a month or even a few years or even 10 or even 20. I've known of people that have lost their faith after 10 or 20 or 30 years. It's really, there must be endurance in us. And what does that endurance come from? Well, of course, it's by the grace of God helping us. But it has to also be our intensity that we add to the grace of God or that the, ad, the grace of God adds to us that would be a better way to put it. There must be this intensity of living by faith with patience. So I would suggest to you that the fruit of the incarnation, one of the fruits, of course there's many fruits, but one of the fruits that I think is very important for our day is patience. Now whether or not you're patient when you're in traffic, that's not so important. I prefer that you didn't cut people off and didn't swear at them and such. But I'm not talking about the personal uh, personality characteristic of patience. Some people are more patient than others in that way. I'm talking about spiritual patience, where we struggle in the spiritual life, doing the right things, following the commandments, struggling to love our brother, keeping our mouths shut, saying our prayers, praying for people that haven't been doing well for a long, long time, or maybe they're dead, and maybe they weren't doing well when they died. I know a lot of people like that. Patience is to continue to pray for those people, to continue to struggle even when things are difficult. Not necessarily difficult in terms of some great crisis, but just going on with life, day by day, living patiently. We're not a very patient world anymore. We want everything right away. We want our hamburger within a minute or so of ordering it in our car. We want everything fast. And spiritual life is like that too for a lot of people. They want things fast. But that's not the way spiritual life is. It happens slowly. It happens when you are intense. And the incarnation is a perfect example of how to be patient. The Lord Jesus Christ was incredibly patient. One would say infinitely patient. He humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant, to a, a society that was going to reject him by and large. The majority of them were. He was born in obscurity, in a cold cave, and he lived in poverty. He didn't have a place to lay his head. Those that he came that he loved either ran from him or ran to get people to kill him. He had to be very patient. He even had a trusted disciple whom because of his foreknowledge, of course, he knew would betray him. And he treated him the same as everybody else. Would you do that? If you knew you had a Judas among you, would you still treat him the same as other people among you? I don't think we would, or most of us wouldn't. This is patience. Patience is allowing the, the will of God to work throughout your life. And the incarnation shows this. And the all of these fathers and mothers who were faithful show this. They were terribly tormented. Uh, Jeremiah was in a pit of a lime and, and the skin burned. Isaiah was cut in half with a saw. The prophets, basically a prophet, if he prophesied to the people, his life expectancy was not real high. There are not too many prophets that died a natural death. They were rejected by their people. And the greatest prophet of all was rejected by his people. Yet in his patience, he continued to teach, knowing that most people would reject him. And even to this day, I would hazard that I think it's pretty clear that most people that call themselves Christians are not. Not really. Their hearts are not really changed. Even in the Orthodox Church, many people that call themselves Christians don't understand how to live as Christians. Clergy encounter those kinds of people all the time. And you do too. What do you think about those people? 
Maybe you're irritated with them. Maybe you think, why am I wasting my time with them? Well, there's no patience in that. The Lord was willing to spend his time with Judas. The Lord is willing to spend his time with us. The Lord was willing to become a man and it encountered all of these obstacles, all of these difficulties, all of this pain for us. And the majority of us barely, barely notice it. Even those of us that call ourselves Christians, so often we are living like in a dream state, some sort of catatonia or something, not seeing what's right in front of us. But if we are like the fathers and mothers of the Old Testament, we're like the saints, and I hope you know many of their lives, you can see how a, a unifying theme in the life of these people is patience. Patience in allowing the will of God to work in their life and, and struggling and not stopping. This is very important. And it's possible because of the incarnation. All these beautiful examples are before us and we're going to read about, of course, the nativity story. We'll read that tomorrow multiple times. <coughs> we'll read it on nativity. And we see how patience is present in all of the things that are happening. We read it today. Joseph is told that that which is in her is by the Holy Spirit. No other explanation. Well, wait a minute. She's pregnant. He knows how people get pregnant. And then the angel says that which is in her is by the Holy Spirit. Does he ask for an explanation? He just believes and he's patient. And he had to have a lot of patience. He was now going to marry a woman who was with child. So that in the world he'd been, he'd been cheated on. And that woman could have been stoned. And if he didn't exercise his prerogative, that most people would expect that he should to have her stoned, then he could be at risk. So he was patient and trekked on up to Bethlehem and then the baby was born and then went to Nazareth and lived in basic obscurity for 30 years. And then at the time of our Lord's ministry, Joseph was old. He was 110 years old. So he died before seeing that promise. Of course, I'm sure he knew that this was the Savior. But he was a little bit like Moses, shall we say. He got to see the promised land, but not to go into it. But he's a great hero because of his faith. And with his faith, of course, is humility and patience. You can't really have patience without humility. The two go hand in hand. And you really can't have those two things without love. That's sort of a triumvirate of, of virtues. There's another thing in this epistle that really strikes me when I read it. It says, Women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Isn't that what you should be doing too? Don't you want a better resurrection? I'm not just talking about the resurrection from the dead at the end of the age. I'm talking about now. Don't you want a better life now? Don't you want to trade that which is base for that which is beautiful? You're, you should be making that trade every day. An impatient man takes that which he can have as soon as he can. The patient man waits. The patient man waits. And is waiting on God for a better resurrection, for a better life. This is what we should be doing. This is what the Incarnation teaches us. The whole story of the Incarnation, all the prelude to it, which is all those hundreds of years before, teaches us to be patient, to wait on God, and to expect something better than what you see in front of your eyes. Because what's in front of your eyes mostly is death. 
That's what we mostly see, is death. We should recognize it as what it is. It's death, ego, and sin, and people's false priorities, and dishonesty, and all the rest. It's death. What is alive is what is within. God lives within, and he teaches us about what is alive. But we cannot know this unless we are patient. So, I hope that you pray for patience. Now, I will warn you, if any of you have prayed for patience, you understand what the answer is. The answer is that God puts you in situations where your patience is tested. There is no patience without impatience. Everyone who's a Christian knows this. Now, you can have impatience where you uh, kind of buck against it like a horse would try to buck a person off, or you can give in to the moments that are test your patience and even make you impatient. If you're impatient but trying to give patience to God, God blesses this. Absolutely. But if you're impatient and you rail against it and you judge and you're angry and and you're blind to what God is trying to teach you, then this that moment of impatience doesn't get you anything except irritated, maybe an ulcer, maybe trouble sleeping, maybe a drinking problem, maybe something, but not something godly. So if you pray for patience, and I recommend that you do, I recommend that you do every day. You have to understand that the way God will answer that prayer is by having situations that test your patience. He wants to test your patience so that you can become stronger. We have many children in this place right now, in this church. Obviously, if we coddled these children, didn't let them climb because after all they might fall, didn't let them run because they might trip, gave them everything they wanted. Every time they wanted candy, we gave it to them. Every time they cried, we'd console them. They'd never learn how to be real people. We have to allow them to go in circumstances that are difficult, and we need to teach them. Obviously, we protect them, but not too much. So God protects you, but not too much. He puts you in difficult situations. And this is where you can remember, not necessarily exactly like you're actually coming up with the, the Bible verses, but sort of remember in an overall kind of way the patience of the saints. And you're called to be like them. So you remember this. You remember all of these great Old Testament saints and all of the New Testament ones and all of the saints that adorn our walls or in our homes, how they lived with patience. If they did that, can't we? I think we can. To me, that's a great application of nativity. We see how it came about. Patience was everywhere, in everyone. So we must live patiently. May God help you. God bless you. Amen.